<clears throat> and thank you very much to all of you who are joining this webinar, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, for those of you who are abroad and have been watching the scenes unfolding over the last uh, 10 days here in South Africa, I'm sure it must be an anxious time for you, uh, worrying about family members, worrying about friends that are here in South Africa. But I want to give each and every one of you the assurance uh, that we will not stop fighting to ensure greater safety and security for your relatives, uh, and that we have been on the front line of ensuring that there is a restoration of the law and order uh, that is so desperately needed here in South Africa. So please rest assured that um, things have started to calm down somewhat today. There is still events and, uh, and incidences happening around the country, but the situation has certainly stabilized over the course of the last uh, 12 hours, largely as a result of the deployment of the South African National Defense Force. I want to give you all the assurance, South Africa is not in a civil war. Um, this is not uh, the scenes that you witnessed in Somalia and the like. This is essentially an internal ANC battle that has spilt onto the streets of South Africa and which has had dire consequences. And I'll talk a little bit about that a bit later. Um, for those of you um, who are tuning in and have not been following events of the last few days, um, I, the moment the uh, violence broke out, was informed by my colleagues in KwaZulu-Natal, and obviously the things started to come through on social media. And sitting in Cape Town, um, it was very difficult to comprehend what exactly was going on. Uh, it couldn't have been a more normal day on Monday in Cape Town. The sun was shining, uh, people were out getting on with their lives and carrying on as per normal. And my colleague, Dean McPherson, started to phone me in a very panicked state on Monday and said, look, there's a big problem here and I, I think you need to get down here. Um, so we were able to get onto an aeroplane and uh, be touched down at 8 a.m. Uh, on the Tuesday morning, which was the day of probably the greatest scenes of violence and destruction. And flying into KwaZulu-Natal from Cape Town and sitting on the aeroplane and gathering my thoughts, um, I had an expectation of what I would see on the ground when I landed in Durban. Uh, but I must be honest, nothing uh, could have possibly prepared me uh, for the scenes that were awaiting me upon the arrival. And virtually coming in from the air to be able to see the fires broken out around the city, a thick, acrid cloud of smoke hanging over most of Durban, fires still raging, factories alight. Uh, it certainly was a very, very terrible portent of what was to come for the rest of the day. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to travel out into various communities um, during the course of the day. And I've never witnessed anything like that in my entire life. And ne neither did I ever expect to witness the scenes of looting, of violence, uh, of insurrection and criminal behavior uh, that I witnessed there. Uh, to see factories alight, to see investments going up in flames, to see shopping malls being destroyed and looted, uh, to see residents with the palpable fear in their eyes about the uncertainty of what was happening. And with the police service and security service that was completely and wholly unprepared for what was, uh, what was to come. So let's rewind a little bit to the genesis of this. This is a result of the internal fight between the ANC factions, the so-called Zuma Radical Economic Transformation faction and Mr. Ramaphosa's faction within the ANC. Mr. Ramaphosa won the presidency of his party very narrowly. And since then, the vanquished have been reforming themselves and uh, realigning their forces and have found a rallying point in Mr. Zuma, Mr. Magashule and others. And as the net of uh, the misdeeds of all of these people of the last uh, two decades in South Africa starts to tighten. So you've seen the internal battle for control of the ANC start to hot up because if you control the ANC, uh, it is the governing party. It means that you've got control of the levers of state and you can then manipulate them as Mr. Zuma did so skillfully for over a decade to prevent yourself being held accountable. Uh, Mr. Zuma was jailed not for any of the high crimes and uh, treasonous behavior of himself, the corruption, the 783 charges of fraud, corruption, and racketeering. He was jailed last week because he showed contempt for the constitutional court by failing to appear before the court, 
as a result of inquiry into his failure to attend the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into State Capture that took place. I believe the genesis of what we've seen this week was the initial gatherings outside Mr. Zuma's homestead in Nkandla 10 days ago, where we saw large crowds being allowed to gather in spite of the lockdown re uh, restrictions, in spite of the, uh, the uh, Gatherings Act, uh, and they were brandishing weapons and they were making threats. And as I've said to so many colleagues, it didn't take James Bond to be able to understand what was going to come next. And so the first mistake was allowing that gathering to take place because when that crowd saw that the, if they showed enough violence, if they brandished enough weapons, the police would back off. It has emboldened, I believe, a lot of what we saw happening in the course of this week. A complete failure of domestic, uh, inside domestic intelligence which should frankly have been able to predict where this was going to go, where the ring leaders were. They certainly were not hiding themselves. They were very brazen and open on social media about what they were going to do. And yet no action was taken to prepare the province for what came. And unfortunately the president, because he's unable to straddle this fact, these factions within his own party, was reluctant to have a show of force that was needed uh, the moment the violence broke out in KwaZulu-Natal on Monday by having a show of force on the ground. His Sunday night deployment of 2,500 military for the entire country was wholly insufficient. Only 600 were assigned to KwaZulu-Natal. And if you break that up into two shifts and it had any one time, only 300 soldiers would have been on the ground in terms of, uh, of at any one time in the province, wholly insufficient to meet the scale and magnitude of this. It started as a political a uh, point to prove, breaking in and looting, but pretty soon uh, it gathered momentum and it found very, very fertile ground uh, in the tinder that is South Africa's socioeconomic situation. A country with a 42% unemployment rate, a country with a 70% youth unemployment rate, a country with 30 million of our citizens live below a thousand rand a month in abject poverty, and a system where corrupt politicians have got fabulously wealthy and the networks around them have got fabulously wealthy while income for ordinary South Africans has declined. Coupled with very restrictive lockdown regulations as a failure of government's, com uh, complete failure of government's ability to get on top of the coronavirus uh, pandemic in South Africa and a vaccination program that started way too late and has achieved far too little. And this all created the toxic mix uh, that found uh, the spark from the political arena to ignite it. And so um, I, uh, together with the Democratic Alliance, had to make a choice. And having been on the front line, because Helen Sussman taught all of us that when something's happening, go and see for yourself on the ground so that you can make an informed decision. And I'm very glad I was able to do that because it then fed into an understanding of what the solutions were to address the immediate problem. And whilst this is not a time for finger pointing and, and recrimination, that time will come. Uh, this is a time uh, to get solutions on the ground. And so um, we were <laughs> cajoled the president into having a meeting with us as the opposition. And because the Democratic Alliance had been able to assess the situation on the ground, had been able to understand the dynamics and uh, had been able to have shadow ministers who on top of their brief, I was able to immediately put a nine point plan on the table for the president. I'm often very critical of the president as many of you probably know, uh, but I must say the president was receptive and I think he was grateful to have a concrete plan upon which he could latch on because after that meeting, I'm happy to say that almost all the nine points that we raised at the table have now been actioned. And I think that's a large, part about why a stability is returning to these communities. So chief amongst those suggestions that I made to the president uh, was to massively have a troop surge into KwaZulu-Natal uh, in order to reestablish law and order. In the three days that I was in uh, KwaZulu-Natal and on the ground, it was very clear that the security service had lost the initiative completely, uncoordinated, understaffed, under-equipped, uh, unable to meet the challenge. And so looters were able to run amok and cause significant damage running into the billions of rand. 
And so it was essentially that we get boots on the ground. And I suggested to the president that he significantly ramps up that call up, but at the same time calls in the army reserve to be able to get boots on the ground. And I said to the president that it is expensive. Yes, we understand that, but it is pales into insignificance if one looks at the cost to the South African economy through the economic damage that's been done through the uh, burning of buildings, businesses, factories, and the like. The second thing I said to the president that it was absolutely essential that we get the main arterial routes open into KwaZulu-Natal for three days uh, from, uh, from, from Monday to, to Wednesday. And the, those main routes, the freeways, had been taken over by marauding gangs of looters who were stopping trucks on the freeway and stealing the goods off the back of them and then setting them alight. And so it was essential to use the military equipment, helicopters, troop carriers, and personnel to be able to keep those major arterial routes open so that we could get supplies into KwaZulu-Natal. This is very important because on the ground, uh, many of, almost all the shops, supermarkets, and outlets have been looted. But to exacerbate the situation, their distribution centers were looted and raided as well. So even if shops were to try and reopen, uh, there would be nobody to restock them. They've all been looted. Butcheries have been looted and burnt. Bakeries have been looted and burnt. And so there's been a growing food insecurity problem in KwaZulu-Natal, and it's typified by the kilometers of long uh, queues of people queuing now to try and get food. So it's very essential that we get food. Coupled with that is medical supplies. And many of the industrial parks where the looters went in and burning was done was where the medical equipment for South Africa comes from and medical supplies come from. So it's essential there. And then also the food, the fuel. Um, we need to get fuel into KwaZulu-Natal because it generators that are able to run centers where the electricity infrastructure has been destroyed or damaged. And then to get intelligence onto the WhatsApp groups and to social media, to be able to understand and identify who the ringleaders were, and then be able to apprehend them, and to uh, bring those responsible for fanning uh, the flames of the violence to, to book. And to that end, we've laid criminal charges against Duduzani Zuma, Duduzile Zuma, as well as Mr. Julius Malema, who is the leader of the economic freedom fighters, all of whom have been fanning the flames of violence and looting on social media, encouraging people to do so. And then I said to the president, it's important that you get on the ground uh, because you cannot understand or comprehend the situation until you've actually got boots on the ground. And this is where I believe that we were lucky because having been on the ground uh, in the midst and thick of it, um, you know, having the bullets flying over your head and, and being caught up in, in the mess that was KZN, it gives you a unique perspective. And the president needed to be on the ground, I believe, right from the get-go. Uh, unfortunately, today is the first time that he has visited KwaZulu-Natal. And I think that is a very poor show of leadership uh, when a country needs a strong leader to stand together. But nonetheless, as I said, now is not the time for recrimination. Now is the time for us to have cool heads in South Africa prevailing, for leadership to be calming the situation down and then looking at how we can stabilize and then rebuild as quickly as we can. But the reality is, if I may say, that this will not be the, the last time this ever happens in South Africa as long as we persist with the deep inequality, uh, the deep poverty, the deep exclusion that still exists in South Africa after two decades of absolute policy failure in South Africa. Our economy is not growing. We're not creating jobs. Our education system has left many, many South Africans behind. Our rural economies are collapsing. We have a government that is, is determined while the rest of the world is marching as firmly away from socialism and radical socialism as possible. Even places like Venezuela are now allowing uh, private enterprise and private investment, Cuba, and even Zimbabwe, who is now offering compensation for farmers who lost their, uh, their battles uh, in the land expropriation without compensation that took place in Zimbabwe, have realized that these policies cause poverty, misery, and suffering. And yet in South Africa, we've got a governing party determined to march as quickly as possible and with its arms as wide open as possible towards the very policies that have failed all of these countries. And that is why we're sitting having a debate about whether we should expropriate land without compensation, whether we should nationalize our health service, 
whether we should nationalize pension funds to bail out state-owned entities, whether we should continue to allow the state to have a monopoly on electricity supply, airlines, uh, all sorts of industries, and whether the state should be the be-all and the end-all, the alpha and the omega of everything in South Africa, crowding out innovation and crowding out the private sector. Now, this may sound very strange or, or foreign to, to some of you, or some of you may be expats who, who, who have seen this happening from, from afar. But these are policies that are guaranteed to widen inequality, to deepen poverty, and to cause even more misery and suffering as they've done in Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and Cuba, and many places around the world that have had the misery of having these policies applied. And so that brings me to the purpose of this, of this webinar, apart from the fact that we wanted to brief you and reassure you that we're doing what we can to restore law and order and to ensure that your loved ones, your friends, and your family are kept safe. Uh, it is very, very important that we get support from you to be able to fix the situation. Uh, I doubt you'd be on this webinar today if you didn't have some care or concern for our beautiful country. And so I'd like to make an ask of all of you today, if I may. We're going to need resources and assistance to be able to help rebuild KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng as quickly as possible. We're going to need resources and assistance to be able to bring those responsible for the carnage to justice. And please do not fall into the trap that the ANC and the EFF and others are trying to use as an excuse for this looting, that these are all only poor and hungry people. Amongst the people arrested for looting is a prominent CEO of a country, of a company here in South Africa, who runs a financial management company. People looting in, from the back of their Mercedes Benzes and luxury vehicles. Um, please understand this is also a criminal element to it and a political criminal element. And we need to bring those people to justice through uh, whatever means that we have at our disposal. But most importantly, we need to change South Africa because if we don't change South Africa, this may have been the latest spark, but there are plenty of sparks that could ignite the tinder that is our society uh, in the weeks, the months, and the years that lie ahead of us, particularly as that net starts to close on those responsible for the state capture in South Africa. And so we've got to address those underlying conditions. And to do this, we need to have the reforms that are required to save South Africa, to get it off this terrible, low growth, high debt, high unemployment trajectory that is causing so much misery and suffering. We need to change the economic direction of the country so we can lift those 30 million people out of poverty into opportunity and to give them a job, a stake in the economy and an ability to be able to provide a better life for their children than they themselves have had. And this can only come through a radical policy shift at the heart of government. I believe that the events of the last week are a crucial turning point for South Africa. And it is a hinge of history moment. And that hinge can go either way. South Africa can choose to fall further into anarchy and disaster, or it can use this moment as a hinge of history moment to push the door in the correct direction. And that's where the DA comes in. So you might be asking, well, what can an opposition party do? Well, here's what we can do. And why it is so important that I'm speaking to you today. We can change South Africa. And we've shown where we govern that things do get better. That's why there's no outbreak of this violence in, West, in the Western Cape. It is why the police services and intelligence services in our DA run province are on top of this issue and are prepared uh, in the case of an eventual uh, attack that may come. And you will not see the scenes that you saw in KwaZulu-Natal in the Western Cape. Because we've shown where we govern that we can build a capable government. And I believe that the time has now come for South Africans, who may not all be wearing the same t-shirts, to unite around a set of common values and principles and to build a new majority in South Africa that will finally be able to drive the reform agenda with a majority in parliament through and to be able to get the country onto this next trajectory. And that's where the DA comes in. Uh, we are the second largest party in the country, and I passionately believe that a strong growing DA at the center of South African politics can provide the pivot point around which that realignment of politics can take place, and around those core values of 
non-racialism and respect for the rule of law, constitutionalism, uh, building a capable state, and a social market economy that understands that the state doesn't have to be at the heart of everything, and that we can provide space for the private sector to be able to get in and help create those jobs. That would treat business and investors as partners, not as enemies. And that would give a voice to those 30 million South Africans who have no opportunity. And so we can do this by bringing the ANC below 50% and forcing them into a situation where they would have to do a deal to be able to unite around that common set of values and principles and form a new progressive government. And for some of you who are perhaps skeptical of this, I would like to share with you that I think the green shoots of that new majority have already been on full display in South Africa uh, over two months ago in the South African parliament. And that was when the rational progressives in the ANC united with the DA and a few other smaller parties to drive through the motion that would take action against our rogue public protector who is a handmaiden of the Zuma radical economic transformation factor. And we're able to beat the radical transformation factor in the ANC, the EFF, and one or two of the other more uh, left socialist parties to be able to get that motion through. And I think that shows there are green shoots of people across party lines who want to do the right by South Africa, who want to do the right thing, who are tired of the unemployment, who are tired of the suffering, who are tired of the poverty, and who want to make a difference. And I believe it's now time for us to provide a strong center around which that realignment can take place so that we can bring the strong, stable government that the DA has brought to the Western Cape, to the city of Cape Town, to the city of Midvale, to Nelson Mandela Bay, to Kucha municipality in the, in the Eastern Cape. These are all great examples of governments that work for the people because they're built around those four key values uh, that I spoke about earlier. And so I believe the time for change is here. We've had a crisis, but we can use this crisis as a hinge of history moment to force the spring of reform in South Africa. And that starts with us. But we need to be a strong growing party and we're gonna need your help to do that. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, John, for that insightful sharing of all the efforts that the DA has been engaged in. There are a series of questions which I've grouped together and thanks to all of you who have submitted your questions. We'll try and get to as many of them as possible given the time that we have. The common question from um, Rebecca who is in the UK and Maria and also Nick in the US is regarding what are the measures that as experts they can do to help um, with all the efforts that are currently ongoing in the country. Thanks, Solly, and thanks to, to all of you for that question. Well, of course, you, know, you, need to, you need to be able to help us be able to help South Africa. And so any expertise, any knowledge that you have, we need to find a way to, through DA Abroad, to help you plug into our systems here in the party in South Africa. And so whether it's through policy analysis, whether it's through uh, assistance, whether it's through financial assistance, that you're able to plug in and make a difference in South Africa. As I said, I know many of you are on this thing because you care about South Africa. And you know we're at the coalface here of trying to bring that change. Uh, there's also an opportunity to join up with DA Abroad and to uh, use the international platforms to highlight particularly some of the more damaging policy proposals like expropriation without compensation. Uh, and so I would encourage everybody who has got time, who has got expertise to uh, please make uh, available this in some small way to help us to help South Africa. Thanks, Solly. Thanks, John. The second is your connection is lagging a bit. Second is sorry about the technical issue. 
there. The second series of questions are I see Solly will be, I think he's just quickly checking his connection again. Um, John, just I'm going to say, to Lisa, that unfortunately one of the uh, side effects of the burning yeah. of infrastructure that we've seen over the last few, uh, this last few days has meant that our data and cellular services are down and many of the providers are struggling with connection. Solly, let's see if you can come in again. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. So the second question was from Scott, who is based, who sent about the police response and the level of training that uh, police seems to not have proper training in dealing with the violent incidents. Uh, Yeah, thanks, Solly. Um, yes, and certainly that was one of the major problems. Um, and it is certainly, and just to let everybody on the webinar know that um, I've instructed yesterday evening, I uh, called a meeting of our shadow cabinet, and every portfolio holder has been asked to prepare a, a document for their department on what went wrong and what could be done better in future. And we are going to compile that into a document which we will then present to the presidency. And one of the key areas is SAPS and public order policing. And one would have thought after the Maracana uh, debacle and the um, Farlam Commission of Inquiry into it, that public order policing would have absolutely got a better focus than it has very clearly not over the course of the last few years. The police in Durban were, and the rest of KwaZulu-Natal were completely caught by surprise by this. Um, as a result of that, um, they had no weaponry they had no uh, insufficient rubber bullets to be able to quell uh, the crowds in a non-lethal way. Uh, many of the police stations did not even have uh, the required equipment to, to use those rubber bullets, even if they had them. And in a Monty Python-esque way, even ran out of ammunition and had to call on the private sector to be able to help provide ammunition to the SAPS during the height of the, of the unrest that we saw. Um, and so these are all issues which need to be taken up. But you may recall in the last election, one of the things that we spoke about quite strongly was a professional police service. And unfortunately, the lack of training, lack of resources, and uh, lack of professionalism within the SAPS. And let me be very clear, there are very many brave men and women in blue who serve well and who served well during this crisis. But unfortunately, they were a minority. Uh, the majority of SAPS personnel were untrained and unprepared for this. And what really touched me in quite a profound way, uh, and probably was some of the more emotional moments, was going around communities and seeing community members that were manning roadblocks, standing point in their community. They became the thin blue line in the absence of the security services of protecting property and lives and communities from being completely overrun by criminal elements and thugs uh, intent on hurting and stealing. Uh, and seeing those people and, and seeing the barricades, that the makeshift barricades that they had erected, uh, and looking at in their eyes and just feeling the palpable fear that they felt. And then to have a police van come past, you know, every hour or so and wave and give a thumbs up to the people manning the barricades. This isn't, this isn't the way it should be the radical right and the far left and everything in between agree on one thing. And that is that the state has a monopoly on violence and it is the right to use it to, in order to, uh, to restore law and order. And yet here it was the community, private security companies, uh, neighborhood watchers, community police forums who were standing on the front line, uh, defending and protecting uh, the rule of law in South Africa. And so we need to radically overhaul the South African police service. We need a far more professional police service that's trained and equipped to be able to meet the challenge. Uh, and I really hope, as I said, that this event of the last week are used as a hinge of history moment to be able to bring these reforms and some of those reforms 
exist about how we carry out public order policing in South Africa. So we ensure that this never, ever happens again. And that we have a president and leader and commander in chief who's willing to use his resolve in the interests of the country. Because I think part of the problem was that Mr. Ramaphosa was very reticent to deploy the military and security services because he was thinking first and foremost of the factions within his own party rather than first and foremost what was in the best interest of the country and the people of South Africa uh, who he leads. And uh, you know, we were going to obviously radically overhaul the way things are done. Thank you, Solly. John, um, Solly has just messaged me to say that due to load shedding, um, it's been very difficult to connect, as you previously mentioned. So I'll continue um, to ask a question to you. So Rebecca Ryan says, hi, I'm in the UK. My parents, sister and niece li live in Waterfall, one of the worst affected places in KZN. Friends tell me that they're spending seven hours queuing for food and fuel, mostly with no result. Will food and fuel reach them? And how can we as expats help? Thanks for the question. And may I just say how sorry I am. I'm sure it must be a, type of, a time of maximum anxiety for you. Uh, and that certainly was one of the areas that was worst affected. The looting of the Watercrest Mall and uh, the surrounding areas there were terrifying for residents. Um, I spoke last night to some of the distribution agents for food. Uh, and I can say that Checkers and Woolworths have distribution centers that are still intact. And last night they were, were doing a restock of all of their stores, uh, but they were obviously limiting what, what customers could buy. Um, and unfortunately, I think this has triggered in a panic buying uh, stage. So people you know, who have stuff are now trying to get stuff. They uh, inform me that they will be getting uh, supplies in from other, country, uh, other parts of the country. Um, we are also, through our MP, Chris Hunsinger, who's our Shadow Minister of Transport, um, working with the Trucking Association, and there's, I think, about 55 tons of food that is going to be uh, leaving various parts of the country to get into KZN uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, I can confirm that the N3 and N2 are now secured and are open, so I imagine that the, the flow of fuel and food into those areas is going to uh, continue. Pick and Pay's distribution center in Pantown, I did a video outside that uh, two days ago, it was burnt and looted, um, but they were looking at alternative ways to get things up and running. I've said to the president as well that what one of the things that we can consider is using uh, regional airports like Virginia Airport in Durban North, Oraby Airport in Peter Maritzburg, and various other private airstrips that are located around the country to fly in food. Um, luckily, SAF Air as well, and uh, one of the airlines that's flying has offered passengers traveling from other parts of the country to Durban to carry an extra 20 kgs. So if there are people from South Africa that are on this webinar or have relatives who are considering traveling there, please consider filling a suitcase with basic foodstuffs and bringing it with you to KwaZulu-Natal. Um, I imagine that things will start to stabilize and normalize uh, in the next 24 hours and that those food routes should be up and running, but we are monitoring it very closely. And if even further intervention is required, uh, we will certainly be at the forefront of that. But my understanding from the retailers is that they expect to get things up and running and restocking those shops, um, provided the security is there and provided the situation is stabilized, uh, back to normal uh, in the next 24 hours. So hopefully we'll be able to avert that, but it is something that we are monitoring. Um, if your parents need specific assistance, I can, uh, if you can give Lisa your contact details or, or get in touch with your DA broad rep, uh, we will see what we can do through our local councillor network to assist in getting some uh, assistance to them. Um, I'm also going to be in Peter Maritzburg on Mandela Day, which is on Sunday, uh, to try and lead some of the cleanup efforts and to, to get on the ground and just help people piece, piece their lives back together again on the ground. Um, so I'll also particularly be able to have a look at the waterfall situation on my way up to Peter Maritzburg. Thanks, John. Then we have a question from Ndumiso. He says, do you think if Cyril Ramaphosa had invoked section 37 earlier, this damage would have, um, how would this damage have been like in South Africa? And then Sharon from Switzerland asks, should there not be a state of emergency declared? Um, yeah, well, I think that the president should have uh, made a deployment far sooner of the military. I would have done it on Sunday night. 
and I would have done it, um, you know, and, and say, they say hindsight is a great thing, but I, you've asked the question. Um, I would have uh, made a far bigger deployment and then used what was necessary out of that deployment rather than having the piddly deployments and then having to go and, and boost it. Um, so I think as a president, you go in hard and you go in early to reestablish law and order um, rather than trying to do it in dribs and drabs, as we saw, and, and we saw what the result was. I think we could have saved a lot more infrastructure. I think we could have saved many other businesses. And I think we could have brought uh, the disorder to heal far sooner had there been sufficient resources on the ground. Um, I don't think that a state of emergency is, is necessary. And, you, you know, a state of emergency is fine, uh, you know, but we already have a curfew in place. Uh, the curfew is at 9 p.m. And that was completely disregarded because... Uh, the um, there was nobody to enforce it. And my worry with the state of emergency is that you would then automatically force the law-abiding citizens who are manning point and are the, are the thin line between lawlessness. They would then be forced indoors as well, and they law-abiding citizens will will obey. But the looters will then have free reign to go wherever they want and loot wherever they want. So I think that the and I, I want to make this point as well to international audiences. That people are saying, oh, well, this is, you know, a civil war. It's not a civil war. Um, this is unrest. And, and there is a political element around it, but it is not a civil war. And the deployment of the military has been done absolutely in terms of the South African Constitution. Section 201 authorizes the president to deploy the military in conjunction with the SAPS uh, to save love and property in South Africa. So it is all happening perfectly constitutionally. The constitutional safeguards of reporting to parliament are in place and the letters have re relevant letters of deployment have been lodged with parliament as required by the law. Um, I would be reluctant to use a state of emergency now. Well, I think the situation is under control now. Um, and I think that there's nothing you can't do under a state of disaster that you could do under a state of emergency anyway. So um, yeah, I think that Look, if the situation worsens, if there's a flare up again, it might be something to consider. But right now, I think the situation is largely under control and being contained. Um, there are a few sporadic incidents happening, but I think by and large, it's under control. Thank you, John. Um, Bailey Matters asks, you mentioned policy needs to change in order to bring South Africa back again. But it seems South Africa is so long gone that I can't even imagine anything bringing it back. What are some of the fundamental things that South Africa needs to change and how can even the DEA help? Well, I think it's it's not rocket science, but what needs to be done. Um, and um, I don't think South Africa is long gone. I, I'm very optimistic about the future. I don't think I'd be doing what I did every day if I didn't passionately believe that there was a better future for South Africa that lies ahead. And it all comes down to the tough choices we're going to have to make uh, in the coming uh, months and coming years ahead. And there's going to be some tough choices we've got to make. Um, I think that, that, we, that we've got to start with breaking this notion that the state's got to control everything. I think that's what lies behind cater deployment. I think it what lies behind the failed state-owned entities and why we have an airline that doesn't fly, an electricity generator and provider that doesn't provide or generate electricity, uh, and why we have all these failed state-owned entities that drain huge money. So I think there's a number of things we've got to do and a number of policy interventions that I believe almost overnight would start to send the right signals out. I think we've got to walk away from job killing, investment killing policies as a start. So let's walk away from these apocalyptic policies of expropriation without compensation, nationalization, uh, state control, and allow the private sector to do what it does best in any other functioning economy, which is create jobs and, and grow the economy and grow income. Uh, I think we've then also got to get government out of the way uh, particularly if I look at the electricity generation and supply industry, it's a complete government monopoly and it is a disaster. I think that we could create a whole greenfield industry in South Africa around renewable energy and alternative energy generation and supply. And that would create, I think, hundreds of thousands of jobs overnight in that industry. Uh, I think we've also got to focus on our education system. Our education system in South Africa uh, is Victorian and has no, is under-resourced despite the fact that we spend so much money on it, uh, we've got teachers who don't even understand the curriculum that they're supposed to teach, schools that are still using pit latrines. Uh, and uh, I just don't think we're equipping our young people in South Africa for the new world of work in a modern society. I think we've got to look at our labor legislation um, that can be done overnight and get rid of these job killing 
um, job killing, investment killing policies like triple B double E. If we want to have empowerment policies, let's have empowerment policies that focus where the need is most. And that's the 30 million people who are poor, not enriching BE fat cats. Uh, that leads to price gouging and leads to corruption that ends up costing the people of South Africa. I said this morning on, on, on an interview that corruption is not a victimless crime. The victims of corruption in South Africa are the 30 million people who live now without opportunity. Uh, and then we've got to uh, stabilize the country and ensure this, the political system is stable. And that's why I believe that a strong center-based majority built out of uh, a variety of different parties can be the difference between this country succeeding or failing. I think it's time for, I think we can do better as a country. I think it's time for us to get the best heads in the country around the table, regardless of what color the t-shirt they're wearing is, to get them around the table and say, look, we disagree on many things, but what are the 10 to 15 things we can do in the next decade to get this country moving again, to get our people working again? And I think that the DA has got a big role to play in that. We have a party that proves that we get things done. Even our most vicious opponents have to concede that where we govern, we get things done. Things work. People are employed. Services are delivered. The money's not stolen. Uh, and, and I think that a DA around that table uh, could bring a lot of good for the future of South Africa. Thanks, John. Uh, Birgit from Germany is asking, um, what would you be able to use our financial support for um, if, if we donate? And I'm going to just put in another question in there. Um, some are asking, when will charges be brought against those who incited violence and threatened um, the security of the state? Um, a lot of people are actually asking, when will there actually be this kind of justice? Great. Guten Tag. Uh, danke. Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, look, I mean, you, you can decide how you would like your donation spent, um, you know, whether it's, it's relief, whether it's assisting us to be able to get our message out into communities where we haven't been able to get a lot of traction in the past. Um, I, I, we have a real uphill battle here in South Africa. We a government that uses its position in the state to fund its own, its political activity. So you know, our budget is minuscule compared to what the governing party has through its abuse of the state. So every cent helps, uh, but you can, you can decide best how you would like your, your contribution and, and where you would like it, uh, where you, you, you would like it to go to. Um, I think that, um, uh, sorry, Lisa, what was the second one? Sorry. The, and when will perpetrators oh, be yes, so, so Thanks. So we've already laid charges, Glynis Breitenbach, on Thursday laid charges against the Zuma, the terrible twins in the Zuma family, um, and against Mr. Julius Malema, the leader of the radical socialist EFF in South Africa. But we also have now been sent to us a variety of uh, social media posts, WhatsApps, uh, etc., from alleged ringleaders and Many of them are senior ANC leaders, and we are busy uh, verifying those. And where we have a positive match, we will go and lay a charge for incitement to public violence, uh, which, is, which is a criminal offense in South Africa. And we will hold those accountable. Um, I heard this afternoon from the president's visit to KwaZulu-Natal this morning that he hinted at a, a potential pardon for Mr. Zuma. I think that would be a terrible signal that goes out. I think that it will show that violence pays, that it, you know, if you burn down enough and damage enough, uh, that you will get your way. I think it would be a terrible thing for South Africa if Mr. Zuma was to be, be pardoned. I think he should face the full marks of the law and that the rule of law must apply equally to everyone in South Africa. And, and we intend to do that. We've pursued Mr. Zuma for 10 years to make sure he faces his day in court on the 783 charges of fraud, corruption, and racketeering. And if we allow him to escape uh, through the back door uh, because his supporters threaten violence, well, then I think it's open season on our constitution, on the rule of law, and on law and order in South Africa. Because if you don't like the findings of a court or you feel the, that they're not to your liking, you just gather a mob, arm them, and get them to go out and destroy. And I think that's a terrible precedent for South Africa to set. And to say, I think we can do better as a country. But that starts with accountability. And I don't think we've had nearly enough accountability in South Africa over the last two decades. I think there's an accountability deficit and we've got an opportunity now to address that. And we must stand firm on the rule of law. Um, Angus is asking, hi, John, in your opinion, will this affect the elections with the possibility of ANC being faced with losing power? 
I think the ANC were already facing the potential of losing power, Angus, before this, which is why they are so desperate to delay having an election. They know what's coming. They've seen the effect of pandemic politics in many other countries, I think the local government elections in the United Kingdom, the American presidential election, many others. COVID politics um, has played a part, and our government's done an appalling job in terms of COVID. Uh, they've done an appalling job in, in vaccines. We, we remain one of the least vaccinated nations in the world. Uh, I think we're uh, I think we're way down the bottom uh, in terms of the world, in terms of, of citizens are vaccinated. And it's had a terrible effect on our economy and on our citizens. Uh, and they know that. And I wouldn't like to be a government going into an election with a 42% unemployment rate, an economy that they've crashed onto the rocks, uh, a pandemic which they've mishandled. So I think the ANC were already in trouble before the election. I think this is going to reduce their majority even more, which is why I really you know, am on here saying we need your help. We need you to stand with us because I think we've now got an opportunity to bring the ANC below 50% in towns and cities around, around the country, but also in, at a national level. And that then opens up a huge opportunity to do the building of that new majority that I spoke about that will get South Africa onto a new trajectory of hope and prosperity and off this, this terrible path that we're currently treading. And some of the some of the um, participants are asking, did you actually manage to see some of the SANDF on the ground? Um, I did on the day I left, um, but certainly um, I did see some SAPS. But and that's how I'm able to say that they are they were completely outgunned. I've actually bought one of the rubber bullet cartridges back with me to uh, from one of the sites where they ran out of them. Uh, as a reminder to me about why it's important that you equip uh, the SA, SAPS. Um, they are rolling in. Um, I, my reports from my team on the ground, uh, I convene a National Security Council meeting within our uh, shadow cabinet um, regularly. The reports are the stabilization is happening and, uh, and the like, and the military are there. And as I said, they've secured the arterial routes uh, so that we can get the trucking and, uh, and, and freight into KwaZulu-Natal so we avert a, a food crisis. Then um, Ms. Tom, Mrs. Thompson says, are there any plans to provide medication to those who have, are chronic patients in Durban because 90 pharmacies have been destroyed? Um, is there any plan to bring medication to old age homes and also disabled homes and hospitals that need this medication um, ASAP? Um, remembering that we are facing a pandemic of COVID and from my families who work in hospitals are suffering right now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is something I've got a work stream working on. It's not only um, uh, the, the medicines getting it, it's the fact that many of the distribution centers were burnt and looted. We even had uh, COVID vaccines looted. Uh, and, you know, the, the COVID, the fight against COVID in the, in the province has been set back significantly. We've lost essentially two weeks of, of vaccination. Um, it's just not been possible to vaccinate. And I think we're going to feel the long term effects that in the midst of of the third wave of, of the Delta variant. But yes, we've got plans to, to get medication and it's one of the, the key areas I spoke to the president about, about getting uh, medication and, and it's also oxygen. Uh, a number of factories that produce oxygen were damaged, uh, or were not able to open. And so we've got to get oxygen into our hospitals as well. So yes, it is a focus. Um, and I've got, uh, I've got our team working on that. Uh, to get those medicines into KwaZulu-Natal as quickly as possible. Um, I, know, I know that some pharmacies are, uh, are opening uh, extended hours now, uh, the ones that are open, to be able to address people's queries. My, my sister volunteered in, in one the other evening. Uh, it, it, it was open till, I think, three in the morning where people were able to access that medication. And we obviously want to find more sites that, that are able to do that until we get those other pharmacies back up and running again. Um, John, I'm going to ask you a final question now. We do have more than 100 questions, so it's difficult to get to every, every question. Apologies for that um, to everybody on the call. Um, Mr. Plout is asking, I'm really impressed by the DA's response, expert, on the ground and engaged. One question, is it your understanding that this was an attempt to seize the state? State capture in another form, which would leave the Zuma faction in charge of the country? Um, yes, I do think so. And I think if one looks at the instigators behind it, as I said, the original spark that uh, that set the Tinder alight, this was definitely a, 
a move by the Zuma faction. As I've said so many times to my colleagues in, in the shadow cabinet, uh, politics is no different from physics. And some of you will be familiar with Newton's third law of motion, which shows that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we've seen that playing out within the governing party. So the president moved against Ace Magashule, uh, the secretary general of his party. And within a week, uh, his health minister, who is an ally of the president, uh, was embroiled in a, a tender scandal involving COVID funding, which could only have come from within the governing party. Um, and that was the opposite reaction. I think what we're seeing here is an equal and opposite reaction to the jailing of Mr. Zuma. And it's why I'm impressed on the president. He's got to stamp his authority because if he allows them to even get a foot in the door, uh, it's going to be the end for him because they will then seize power and, and knock him out of power, which is why I, I cannot fathom why there wasn't a strong, decisive response from the get-go to be able to uh, re-establish law and order. I think it would have been a great opportunity for Mr. Ramaphosa to have said, we will not brook this type of lawlessness and that there's no the only legitimate way to take power is through the ballot box, not the barrel of the gun. Um, but nonetheless, I think we've been able to save the situation somewhat, uh, but now needs to be contained and those perpetrators need to be brought to justice. Thank you very much, John, for answering all of those questions. Um, please finalize with your closing and then we're going to let everybody go back to work. Fine, thanks very much for everybody. And thanks for the interest that you've shown in in this country. This is a special place, this little, little piece of rock on the southernmost tip of this great continent of Africa. And I think she's well worth the fighting for. I think that she's a great, we have a great country. And as I said, I passionately believe our best days lie ahead of us. Um, and, you know, we are standing on the front line, uh, defending the rule of law, defending the democracy and, and defending the countries and, and its citizens. And my final plea to you today is to stand with us. Stand with us on this front line as we as we move forward to try and build a better future for South Africa that is more inclusive, that is one of hope and one of prosperity, and one which matches the dream that that Nelson Mandela had for our country uh, of a united, prosperous nation uh, you know, uh, uh, that is free and uh, and in which we celebrate our diversity. Uh, I think that's a future worth fighting for, and it's one which I've committed myself to. And I'm asking you to stand alongside us as we as we fight for that better future. So thank you for your time and your concern and your care. Um, we can do better and we're going to. Thank you everybody, have a wonderful day.